So for the last two Sundays, we've gone through a systematic introduction to the book of Revelation, setting the foundation for how we will study the remainder of the book. But as, as scripture would have it, as the Lord would have it, we have to do yet another introduction because we're about to enter a mini-series of sorts. For the next seven weeks, we will be looking at the letters to the seven churches. And so this is kind of like a study within a study. And so we'll have to do some foundational groundwork to better prepare us to be able to receive the lessons that the Lord has for us through these letters. That's one of the things that we have the privilege and opportunity to do by having uh, no timeline. There's no deadline that we have to finish Revelation by such and such a date. We get to be led by the Lord and uh, just really soak in his word. So we're going to be looking at these letters in a systematic way so that we can have a consistent view of observation, interpretation, and application of these very important letters. And so the first step is observation. Number one observation, the letters up to the churches were literal letters intended for literal churches. These churches actually existed in the first century. And the experiences described in the letters actually happened. These are not metaphors. These are not allegories. They're actual letters to be passed on to these churches. So once we observe what it says, we have to then interpret what does it mean. And so number two, the interpretation of these letters that is that they are an interim evaluations before their final reviews. That's one thing that is common through all these letters is that the Lord graciously gave them, and he gives all of us, the truth, good, bad, and ugly, and the opportunities to respond and sufficient time to respond. So we see that there's warnings. There are warnings for these churches and he says, you have time to address these shortcomings. It's kind of a midterm exam. If you can think back to when those days when we were in school, we have a, like a midterm and then we have a final. Consider these letters to be the midterm. This is the midterm exam. Or if you're in the workplace, kind of a, an informal evaluation, an assessment midway through the year until your final assessment where you are then going to be given a raise if your performance is improved or so on. So it's a, an interim evaluation before their final reviews. And the Lord gives enough time to be able to respond. For unbelievers, I mean, this is this dual application here. The letter is for the church, but it also reveals God's character towards all people. For unbelievers, uh, the Lord reveals their condition their inability to reconcile themselves to God and that Jesus is the way. So he lays out all that information to unbelievers through our sharing of the gospel, through our examples in life, and he gives them sufficient time to respond. Now, it may not be the time that they think they have, but in the Lord's perfect economy, they have exactly the time they need to respond. And for believers, he shows where we need to grow and he gives us the time to do it before ushering in a storm of correction. The Lord will, unless it's an urgent matter of life and death, the Lord starts out with a little whisper. He'll gently whisper to us, touch us, tap us, hey, no, take note of this element in your life and give us an opportunity to respond. If we don't, that little whisper becomes a, a voice, hey, or poke, an elbow, hey, take notice of what I'm telling you. The Holy Spirit is always doing this. And if even we ignore that, the voice gets louder, and now it's a little shove until, as I call it, the divine two-by-four upside the head. He's going to get our attention one way or the other. And so I've learned in my walk with the Lord, I'd rather hear the whisper. The two-by-four is very painful. It's uncomfortable. I'd rather not go through it. So like, Lord, please whisper to me. I know you always do. And if not, it's because I'm not listening. So he gives us that time to respond before dropping the hammer of correction. So having this observation interpretation, what's the application? What are we, what are we going to look at these letters for in terms of 
our growth and what do we do with this? Number three, application. They're diagnostic tools for disciples. These letters are diagnostic tools for disciples. Now, a traditional application is to view these letters as describing a period of time within the church age. The church age is defined as from the day of Pentecost all the way on through to the rapture of the church. That's considered the church age with a dispensational point of view, and we'll cover what that means uh, in a further study. And so there are many who believe that these letters are laid out chronologically and they describe the general tenor of the church at large, a church universal. So in that context, they would look at the letter to the church at Ephesus as being like the early years of the church, like the first 300 years would be the age of Ephesus type of thing and describing that. And then after that would be Smyrna, a couple hundred years after that. And so that at the end of the church age would be the letter to the church of Laodicea. Now, no surprise to you that I don't agree with that. <laughs> I seem to be a little, little, have a different angle on things than the, than the mainstream. Now, I don't agree for a couple of reasons. One, it's too broad to say that this letter of the, to the church in Ephesus is addressed to all of the church between first and third centuries. It's just too broad. Because there's faithful believers, there's unfaithful believers, there's believers with this kind of uh, shortcoming or that blessing or whatever. It's too general to be of any help. It's too subjective. How would you know when the age of Ephesus is past and now the age of Smyrna for the church has started? It's basically arbitrary. And then that runs into problems if one thinks of the Lord returning for his church in 1940, and here we are at 2617, what happens? Do we just keep extending the church of Laodicea for all that time until the Lord comes? Or do we recalibrate where, you know, it, it's just goofy. I, I call it goofy. And C, it's not applicable. These, these letters don't apply to the church if you look at church history, they're not applicable to what the church was dealing with at those particular ages in history. So for those reasons, I disagree with that, you know, that application. But also this. In these letters, we, we see, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That is included in every letter. Now notice the word churches. It's plural. Okay, so he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. All are to be read, all are to be applied. If we view these letters as somehow uh, describing the characteristics of the church throughout history, then, well, we're not living in the first century, therefore we can ignore the letter at Ephesus because we're not there anymore. Or even if it applies to a church, believers can say, well, I don't go to the church at Ephesus. It doesn't apply to me. But the Lord says, hear what, what the Spirit is saying to all the churches. So all the letters are applicable. All the letters need to be studied. All the letters are important at all times. And so, yes, the letters are applicable to local churches. Every fellowship should and the leadership should do a self-examination, is this church fall into one of these seven categories? Absolutely. That is a, a great diagnostic tool for church leaders. But it's also important that it's applicable to individual believers. Because if we apply these letters to only the church one attends, that gives believers a false sense of spiritual growth or where they are. And in your notes, I've put this down. An error of the church in America is sanctification by association. What I mean by that is many believers think that by attending the right church, it is the sign of growing in sanctification. They attend a solid church, so therefore they're okay. No self-examination is needed. And we could all fall into that trap. Because if we're at a church where the word is being taught and 
the Lord is being worshipped and praised and prayer and all of that the Lord has called has is happening that can happen in spite of a lack of growth in its people the letters need to be taken personally very individual that's our walk you know my walk is different than yours and so we have to assess ourselves using these letters as a diagnostic tool what kind of believer am I And this is going to be the focus of our study in the letters. So the question will not be, do I attend an Ephesus church? But rather, are you an Ephesus believer? So when we read these letters, and I use Ephesus as an example because we'll be studying Ephesus this morning. But through the seven weeks, we should be asking ourselves, am I this type of believer? Am I a Smyrna church believer? Am I a Pergamum church believer? We're going to make this very personal to ourselves as a diagnostic tool. One thing you may or may not have known is that there is a specific structure to these letters, all seven letters. All of these letters have a standard structure of seven components. And I think it's helpful to know that because we'll be able to compare and contrast what we see in these letters to glean even uh, more application of the truth. And so let's take a look at these seven components. The first is the audience. Who is it addressed to? There's no confusion. No one's left wondering, was he talking about me? Because there's, the audience is very clear in each letter. And by extension now, we're, we're looking at it personally. Every letter is applicable to us in terms of reflection and analysis and meditation. The second component is the author. Now, we know that Jesus is the author of all of these letters, but there are characteristics of him that were described in chapter 1 that are then included in these letters. And it's very significant of what the Lord chose to highlight out of those seven descriptions in chapter 1. He takes one of those descriptions and inserts it into the letter, and they're different for every church. There's significance to that fact that he chose that characteristic to include in that church and we're going to see that this morning there's also commendation a description of what they're doing right substantial praise the Lord provides specifics not nebulous platitudes he gives specifics so that the church can understand yes keep doing this it's the right thing very specific The fourth component is the flip side, a rebuke. Description of how they are falling short. Now, sometimes the rebuke is more general than the commendation, and that is deliberate. Because if the Lord were to point out one thing as an example, we... By extension, we, I mean, clearly the churches that were being addressed, but we, by extension, we would just look at that one thing and either exclude it, oh, I never did that, so it doesn't apply to me, or address that one point and not address the larger, broader issue. So he was very specific in his commendation, not so specific necessarily in his rebuke because he wanted the church to address the larger issue. And it's sometimes, oftentimes, multifaceted, and it, it's, you can't encompass all that is involved in a short letter. Having provided commendation and rebuke, he also commands number five, corrective action. What they need to do differently. It's simple, clear, and just as important, within their ability to carry out. The Lord never commands somebody or some group to do something that he hasn't equipped them to do. Very important. If he's called us, he's equipped us. If he's commanded us to interact in a certain situation and respond in a certain way, he has equipped us to do that. He never leaves us high and dry and, well, good luck with that. He never does that. He never does that. That's what's to be done, the corrective action to fix what was wrong and number six are the consequences what happens if they don't take that corrective action there are going to be consequences they're not left wondering 
He's very specific as to the consequences of what happens if they don't carry out the corrective action. He has a perfect track record of doing what he says. So, and, and so when he says this is going to happen, only a fool would bet against that. What the Lord says is going to happen, it's going to happen. Those are the consequences, but he doesn't leave it there. Finally, number seven, there's a reward. There's a reward for what happens if they do take that corrective action. There's something to look forward to in obedience. There's encouragement. And we know that he carries out his promises both in the positive and in the negative of consequences. All seven of these components exist at some level in all seven letters. There's one or two churches who don't have an actual rebuke. But that's because there's nothing to rebuke. It's important to note that rebuke is blank. They didn't forget. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a partial letter. If there's no rebuke, it's because there's nothing to rebuke. And with all of that said, now let's get into the book of Revelation chapter 2, starting in verse 1, this letter to the church in Ephesus. Now, Jesus is dictating this to the apostle John. And he is faithfully recording what what is spoken. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet, this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Read through that pretty quickly, but in there are those seven components. So let's take a look at those seven components. Now the audience is obviously the church in Ephesus. Ephesus was uh, an important city of commerce, It was also the location of the temple for the Greek god Artemis, or the Roman god Diana. And actually, the temple of Diana was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And so Ephesus was in the center of a lot of false religion and teaching as being a port of commerce. People traveled through with all different types of beliefs. Ephesus is the only one of the seven churches that had another letter written to them that ended up as being authoritative scripture. So that's that's noteworthy. There'll be some significance in that. Now, you might have noticed this list starts with the number two. Sometimes I make an error in the outline, but this was deliberate because I wanted to line up with the seven components that we just looked at so that you can connect the dots. Number two is the author. So number two is going to be an attribute of Jesus. Verse one says, him who holds the seven stars. The attribute there is that he has sole authority over his churches. We saw that symbolism defined by the Lord himself in chapter one. If a fellowship is truly Christ's church, then it must be done Christ's way. He is to be worshipped his way, and his word must be taught. Pastors and elders are caretakers of Christ's church. Any authority given to them over the church are actually responsibilities before the Lord. That is how I saw my role as associate pastor, as elder, as pastor, church planter. There's authority that the Lord gives me through his word, but that's not really authority, it's responsibility because I'm going to be held accountable before him for what I do with that. So I don't take that lightly. No pastor should take that lightly. 
it's a frightful thing to bear the responsibility of that authority. Because it's not my it's not my church, it's not my authority, it's the Lord's church. I'm just the caretaker, I am the shepherd uh, of, 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 of this flock at this particular time in history. But it's the Lord's. Pastors are not to lord it over their flock. Scripture is very clear about that. Or, in the Brooklyn Standard Version, throw their weight around. <laughs> that, I may write that one day. The scripture says, do not lord it over. Don't throw your weight around. But pastors, elders, are to be gentle, yet firm, with clarity, biblically driven with humility and love. Verse 2. I know your works, how you cannot bear with those who are evil, tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. That leads us to, number three, the, condom, uh, the commendation. thing that they did right. Properly discern truth from error and acted on it. They didn't just point out truth from error, but they acted on it. Their actions were a result of identifying the error, and they dealt with the error. They didn't, just didn't allow it to continue on. That's, that's the difficult part. It's easy to sit back and just, truth, error, okay, we'll have at it. But no, to take the false and error to task and deal with that is the hard work. They had their doctrine nailed down and dialed in. They had a great spiritual sensitivity. We see that because they're the only ones commended for calling out the heresy of the Nicolaitans. In contrast, some of the other churches that we're going to see, in particular Pergamum, some of the members of that church embraced the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Now you might be thinking, who are the Nicolaitans? There's only two mentions of the Nicolaitans in all of Scripture. They both appear in Revelation chapter 2. Now, it is commonly believed that the Nicolaitans were followers of a false convert named Nicholas, who was appointed to be a deacon in Acts chapter 6, verse 6. So if you look at Acts chapter 6, verse 6, where deacons are appointed, in that list of names is the name Nicholas. And so early church leaders have kind of connected the dots and established that the Nicolaitans were followers of this, this false convert, Nicholas. And they called them Nicolaitans. And they embraced an antinomian style belief. And if you remember what antinomianism is, is the belief that profession of faith alone is sufficient. And that means there's no need to be obedient to the word. If you said the sinner's prayer, that's all it takes. And that you don't need to show the fruits of that salvation through works. Obedience is kind of optional for those who are embrace an antinomian belief system. When scripture clearly says we will know our faith by our works, not that works save us, but they are the fruit of our salvation. Verse 4, Jesus says, You have abandoned the love you had at first. Many believe that that love that Jesus is referring to is love of God. And that is, that is true. That is a correct interpretation, but not sufficient. Because, look at 1 John 4.20 in your notes. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. Couple that with the book of Ephesus. And the, the greater theme in the book of Ephesus is addressing relationships. When you think about what the book of Ephesus is at a very high level, it's relationships within the church, relationships within the family, relationships between husband and wife, parents and children. That kind of gives us a little window into what was going on. If Paul had to write that letter to the Ephesians on that topic, it makes sense that there was an issue with how they treated one another. 
And as we see in 1 John 4.20, we cannot claim to love God but hate our brothers and sisters. It doesn't work that way. It's impossible, is what the Apostle John writes. So it's both love of God and love of the brethren that was missing from the church in Ephesus. Jesus said that they had abandoned the love they had at first. They abandoned it. They once had it. They knew they had it, but they simply dropped it. They left it. Abandoned. They didn't throw it away, which is an overt act. When you take something and you throw it away, you know you're throwing it away. But when you're carrying something and then you just let it fall out of your hand and keep walking, it's just something that happens. They abandoned the love of the brethren and of God. They just stopped doing it. It was either inconvenient, too difficult, whatever. They just stopped doing it. They didn't make a big deal out of it. So their error was not only that they had truth and no love, but that they lost sight that it was the Lord's church, that they had their own agenda doing things their way, and people were just an afterthought. We point back to the characteristic of Jesus of him holding the seven stars in his hand amongst the lampstands, that is a symbol of his sovereignty over his churches. See, he's pointing that out. Hey, if you're claiming it's my church, I'm the head. That's what he's saying there. Verse 5. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. Oh, I love this, because... The Lord's corrective action here is just a series of steps. I can follow steps. It's kind of like a recipe. You, you, know, you get the ingredients, you mix this, you mix that, and before you know it, you have a souffle. And he does the same thing here. The corrective action is recognize their error. Repent from their sin. And return to being Christ's church. Those are the steps. He lays it right out there. Recognize. Acknowledge, hey, you're, you're in error. You're in sin. Recognize it. Acknowledge it. Repent. Turn from that. We're not going to do it anymore. Yes, Lord, that was sinful, and we're not going to do it anymore. We're going to do this. We're going to go in the opposite direction, and we're going to be loving. And then return to being Christ's church. The process of confession, repentance, and restoration for them, it's not too late. It wasn't too late for them. He didn't say, up. Oh, too bad, one and done, you're out. Too late for you. He didn't say that. He gave them the chance to take that corrective action and be restored. We may be familiar with the phrase, it's never too late. And we use that often. But scripture says otherwise in some situations. Proverbs 29.1 in your notes. He who is often reproved yet stiffens his neck, will suddenly be broken beyond healing. Wow. What that means is, for those who dig their heels in in rebellion, in response to chastening, may find themselves hardened, their hearts seized up, frozen permanently. That's a dangerous place to be in unrepentant sin. It's a dangerous place to be. And there's no time to waste in repenting of unrepentant sin and being reconciled with God on that. Now, having said that, yes, for some there is a point of no return, but we simply don't know for who and what that point is. Only the Lord knows. So we have to operate under the assumption that it's never too late. We never write anybody off. We say it's never too late. And we continue to share the truth and love of the gospel with those who need it. But if you want to kind of kick it up a notch and tell someone, hey, you know, you're playing around in the sin and Proverbs 29.1, you might be broken beyond healing if you don't repent. That's a warning. That's a, that's a loving warning to warn somebody that there is, there could be that point of no return for them. It happened to Pharaoh. Verse 5. If not, all right, here comes the, the consequence. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. So number six, the consequence. 
Christ will no longer claim it as one of his churches. That's the consequence. He's going to remove the lampstand from those lampstands. There's seven of them, and if Ephesus didn't respond, he's just going to take that lampstand and put it somewhere else. It's not part of that group. No, Jesus didn't say he would destroy that church, just that he would remove the lampstand. That lampstand is still going to exist. It's still going to function, but without the Spirit's seal, anointing, and blessing. And that's what happens to some churches. They stop being the Lord's church, but they don't close their doors. They're still open. But they're just doing it on their own, and the Spirit is not blessing and anointing. There are churches that claim Christ's name but aren't Christ's church. How does a church know when it's Christ's church or when it's not? That's a topic for another time. But verse 7, here we go. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life. And there goes number 7, the reward. Anyone, in this case, the church at Ephesus, if they respond, there's going to be the reward of eternal life and continual blessing. The Lord promised they would be with him in heaven if they take that corrective action. Now, the tree of life was an actual tree in the Garden of Eden. We see that in the book of Genesis. It was actually there. And when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, the Lord had to post an angel to prevent them from coming and eating from the tree. What happened to that tree? Scripture doesn't say, except that the tree reappears in the eternal state. And we will study that later on in Revelation. And so the tree of life is that physical, literal tree, but it's also a symbol of eternal life and continual blessing. And I guess the overall takeaway from this, if we were to sum all of this up in a single sentence, is this. If we have truth without love, then we are doctrinally right but biblically wrong. We, we see Paul write that in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's all throughout Scripture. If we truly believe and know that this is the Word of God, then we should be the most loving people on the planet. Shame on us that we're not. But that's what the process of sanctification is for. Lord, we thank you that um, your Word is true. And because you are the perfect promise keeper, that we have that assurance that we, we will be home in heaven with you when we breathe our last here or you call us home. Lord, because of that assurance, rock solid, guaranteed assurance, that should lift our spirits up. We should be uh, rejoicing. We should be joyful. We should not allow the burdens of this world to weigh us down because we know that in the end we will be with you. Lord, thank you that you point out the truth from your word and that you guide us and teach us through your Holy Spirit to apply the word correctly to our lives. Lord, help us to also be loving, very loving in in what we do with that truth. That it should be to lift others up and to give others that same hope and encouragement that we receive from your word and correction if it's needed but encouragement. Lord, we thank you so much. We want to be used by you more this week than ever before. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.